So I would like to introduce Professor Mark Kamienkowski. He is a theoretical physicist and the current William R. Cannon Jr. Professor at John Hopkins University. His research interests include dark matter, inflation, and gravitational waves. His work on dark matter and the cosmic microwave background have earned him the United States Department of Energy E.O. Lawrence Award in high energy and nuclear physics. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and a member of the National Academy of Sciences, among other honors. He received his PhD at the University of Chicago in 1991. So without further ado, please take it away. Okay, thank you very much. Glad to be here with you guys in Toronto and elsewhere this afternoon. I'm gonna give you a talk about something called the Hubble tension that has arisen in cosmology over the past few years. And I'm gonna start by telling you that I have never given this particular talk. I've been working on the subject for several years, um, but I've not given this particular talk. So I'm curious to get some feedback from you in case I give it again. Um, and so there's this problem that's arisen in cosmology that we call the Hubble tension. It has gotten a lot of attention. There is a quantum magazine article that's um, fairly recent that uh, focused on this by Natalie Walshover, who's a great writer. I can recommend this article. Um, Davide Castelvecchi from Nature News um, had an article, what was it, last summer? Mystery of the Universe's Expansion Deepens with Fresh Data. So this problem has been with us for, you know, about five years, I would say, but it's gotten more serious with time. Um, this is a very nice article um, from February 2019, the New York Times by Dennis Overby. And this was a very nice article that focused in particular about some of the work that my group um, has done on the subject. And I guess now I'll begin with the talk. Um, so, this is a, can you see my cursor? I should ask, okay. So this is a cartoon version of the history of the universe that was put together by the people at NASA um, involved in the Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe, which was a satellite experiment um, designed to study the universe that flew in the 2000s. Um, over the past decade, there's been another project by the European Space Agency called Planck and what it shows you is that as you look further back, as you look at larger, I'm sorry, larger and larger distances, you're seeing the universe as it was at earlier in earlier times, because it takes some finite amount of time for light to travel to us. So things that are fairly nearby, we're seeing them as they were fairly recently. But as we look at things further and further away, um, it's we're looking at things as they were um, at earlier times, younger objects. Um, now, if you look at the sky with an optical telescope, what you will see are lots of stars. And if it's a very powerful galaxy, lots of very powerful telescope, you'll see lots of galaxies. But most of the sky is dark. There's nothing there. But if your eyes operated at radio frequencies, um, you would see a cosmic microwave background. Everywhere in the sky would glow. You would see the entire sky glowing um, very faintly. Um, and this radio frequency radiation is um, the cosmic microwave background. These, this is electromagnetic radiation that's left over from the Big Bang itself. And it was actually emitted not exactly at the Big Bang, but about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And so when we look at this cosmic microwave background, we actually see the very early universe. Um, we see the universe 380,000 years or 375,000 years after the Big Bang as compared with a universe that's now about 13.8 billion years old. And for various reasons, we believe that the first stars formed about 400 million years after the Big Bang. So this is a very quick overview of the history of the universe. Um, here's another slide that I borrowed from my colleague, Adam Reese, um, another member of our department who got the Nobel Prize for discovering accelerated cosmic expansion in 1998. Um, one of the most salient features of the universe is that it is expanding. And I'll talk more about this in the next few slides, um, but this sort of summarizes what I'm about to tell you um, shortly. So the universe is expanding. Uh, this is a plot of the uh, look back time in billions of years. So the universe today is at zero here. We look back zero. Um, the Big Bang is close to 14 billion um, years ago. 
And what it shows you is that the universe was expanding at a very large rate at early times, but then the, the, the expansion rate decay, decayed, it slowed. And at some point though, the expansion rate started to increase again. Um, so this is evidence for something strange in the universe beyond what we learn in um, Newtonian gravity. So the universe is expanding today, but what we expect is that the expansion should be decelerating because every bit of matter in the universe attracts every other bit of matter in the universe. So even if galaxies are flying apart from each other today, the relative velocities with which they are moving apart should be decreasing with time. But Adam and his colleagues discovered that the relative velocities between any two galaxies is actually increasing. And so there's something strange with gravity and this is what we call dark energy. That'll come in later on. <clears throat> Um, but now I want to say a little bit more about the expansion of the universe because the expansion of the universe is key to the, the issue that I'll be discussing today. So this is Edwin Hubble. This is a very old picture. You can tell because he is violating um, health protocols. There is no mask and beyond that he's actually smoking a pipe, which is a double whammy in 2021. Um, but Edwin Hubble is famous because in 1929, he discovered the expansion of the universe. <clears throat> so what he did more prosaically is the following. Um, we live in a galaxy that we call the Milky Way. It's a gravitationally bound system of about 10 million stars. Um, but it turns out that our galaxy is nothing special and there are billions of other galaxies in the universe. So each galaxy contains roughly 10 billion stars. Each galaxy is a gravitationally bound system of those roughly 10 billion stars. And what he did is he found a way to measure or estimate the distance to any given galaxy and to also measure the velocity. So what he found is that every galaxy is moving away from us. And he found that the velocity of every galaxy is proportional to its distance. So every galaxy is moving away from us. <clears throat> so either that means that there's something, you know, highly unpalatable about us that would cause every other galaxy to want to move away from us. That, however, is an absolutely ridiculous explanation. Um, a better explanation comes from the Copernican principle. So the Copernican principle tells us that, that we live in no special place in the universe. Humans, the Earth, the Milky Way occupies no special place in the universe. And if that's the case, then um, the interpretation of these measurements is that every galaxy is moving apart from every other galaxy with a velocity that is proportional to the relative distance between those two galaxies. So what it implies is that the entire universe is expanding. And this is a, a movie to demonstrate that from the European Space Agency. Um, you see every galaxy is moving apart from every other galaxy. Um, galaxies that are close to each other are moving apart with a velocity that's relative, relative velocity that's fairly small, and those that are large separation are moving apart with larger velocities. So this is the expansion of the universe. Um, this is another um, plot to show the same thing I showed you before, the velocity which any given galaxy is moving away from us and the distance. And here is a formula. The velocity with which any given galaxy is moving away from us is equal to the distance times capital H. Sometimes we also write it as H subscript zero. And here H is the Hubble constant. It is the constant of proportionality between the velocity and the distance. And so this is something that you can infer from the slope of this line. So the issue that I'm gonna to discuss today is shown and encapsulated in this figure right here. So these are measurements of the value of the Hubble constant. Um, and there are two different types of measurements. There are measurements that we call local measurements. These are actually analogous to what Hub Hubble did. We try to identify galaxies, um, try to measure the distance, their distances and try to measure the velocities at which they're receding. And then these are measurements that are inferred or values that are inferred from the cosmic microwave background using a much more complicated analysis, but a straightforward analysis, and I'll tell you about it. And the problem that we have, we call the Hubble tension. And the reason is that these local measurements of the Hubble parameter disagree with the measurements from the cosmic microwave background. 
And the discrepancy is fairly big and fairly statistically significant. And so this is the Hubble tension. Why is it that the values of the expansion rate, the Hubble constant, that we infer from the cosmic microwave background differ from those that we infer from local measurements? Now, I should also tell you a little bit about the numbers. Um, so we parameterize the Hubble constant in units of kilometers per second per megaparsec. So remember, the Hubble constant is the constant of proportionality between the velocity and the distance. So it have, should have units of velocity divided by distance. And that's what we see here. Velocities are measured in kilometers per second. And distances we measure in a unit called a megaparsec, which is roughly 3 million light years. Um, but roughly speaking, it's the typical separation between, any two, gal between two galaxies in the universe. So our nearest neighbor galaxy is the Andromeda galaxy. It's about 7 tenths of a megaparsec away. So the values are about 67.4 plus or minus a little bit and 73, 74 plus or minus a little bit. So the local measurements, where do these values of 74 come from? So these come from um, objects that we call type 1a supernovae. So a type 1a supernova is an explosion that occurs at the end of a massive star's life. Now, the reason we use these supernovae for these measurements is that all of them, all type 1a supernovae, have the same luminosity. And so we can infer the distance from how bright it appears. So if somebody turns on a flashlight, and you know what kind of flashlight it is, um, you can tell how far the flashlight is. If it's very close, it's going to be very bright. If it's very far, it'll be very faint. So if we have a so-called standard candle, if there's an object, a cosmological object or an astronomical object um, whose brightness, whose luminosity is known, we can infer its distance by measuring its brightness. Um, the velocities are inferred from redshifts or Doppler shifts. And I'll say a little bit more about this in the next slide or two. So first thing, I want you to, I want to explain why it is that we believe that all supernovae have the same luminosity. So the reason is that a typical massive, a typical star um, shines because it is burning hydrogen to helium in its core. It's do, um, doing a nuclear fusion reaction. Um, it's burning protons or hydrogen to helium in its core. And that is the source of the energy of a star like the sun. Once the hydrogen fuel has been used up at the center of a star, it no longer heats up the interior. And therefore it begins to contract and then is held up only by this quantum mechanical pressure that's um, associated with the, the, the matter in the, in the star. That type of star is called the white dwarf. But it turns out that um, Chandrasekhar, an Indian astrophysicist, showed in the 1930s that a white dwarf cannot hold itself up against gravitational collapse once it reaches a mass about 40% um, larger than the sun. Now, our sun, our star, sorry, our sun is an isolated star. However, most of the stars in the, un in the universe are found in binaries. They're found in gravitationally bound systems of two stars. And what is shown here is that in some cases, if one of the star has become a white dwarf, it can accrete matter from the other star. So even if this white dwarf initially has a mass that's less than the Chandrasekhar mass, about 40% larger than the mass of the sun, um, it can accrete mass and become more massive. But once it accretes just enough to get it over that Chandrasekhar limit, 1.4 solar masses, it undergoes gravitational collapse. And then all the material, when it reaches close to a point, um, reaches a point of extremely high density and then bounces back and produces a huge explosion. And that is called a type 1a supernova. So that is why we think that all type 1a supernova have the same luminosity. Now the distances, um, are something that we have to determine. Now, the way we determine the distance to a supernova is um, a little complicated. There are several steps in what we call a cosmic distance ladder. So I'll explain the first step in the distance ladder. So if we look at a star 
that is not too far away. So let's look, for example, at this particular, this particular star, a faraway star or a nearby star. Um, we look at it from the Earth, but the Earth is not at one point. The Earth is traveling around the sun. So at one time in the year, the position of this star will be in this direction in the sky. But at another time of the year, the position of the star will be at a slightly different position because we will be looking from a different vantage point. If the star is nearby, the difference between those two apparent positions is going to be larger than if that star is very, very far away. I can do a laboratory demonstration. If I move my finger right here, hold it up next to my camera and move it back and forth just a little bit, it looks like it's moving quite a large distance. But <clears throat> if I come back here and move my finger back and forth by the same amount, it doesn't seem to be moving too much. So something similar happens um, with this so-called parallax. So this is what we do. We look at stars in the summer, in the winter, and then we see how the apparent distant, how the apparent position of the sky changes. And in that way, we can actually measure the distance to a given star. Now, it turns out that for these measurements, there is a particular type of star that we use there's called a Cepheid variable. Um, there is the word Cepheid. <clears throat> so it turns out that there is a type of star called a Cepheid variable that has um, the following property. Its luminosity changes with time. So it becomes brighter fairly quickly, and then it decays slowly down to baseline, then becomes brighter quickly and decays down slowly. Um, and it turns out that the period of this oscillation, the time it takes to get from one minimum to the next minimum, is different for different Cepheid variables. And it turns out that a brighter Cepheid variable has a longer period. Wow, I forgot to say, so this got cut off. The x-axis here should say um, period. So this is the Cepheid variable period luminosity relation. And the idea is that if we see a star and we see it get brighter and fainter and brighter and fainter, and we can identify it as a Cepheid variable from the shape of this light curve. And if we measure the time between successive peaks, then we can figure out the luminosity of the star. Uh, you have a question from the audience. What causes the variation of the luminosity in these stars? That is an extremely, there's an answer, but it's extremely complicated. It took theoretical stellar astrophysicists decades to understand it. And it has to do with a very complicated interaction between the nuclear burning at the center of the star and the um, rate at which the outer layers of the star can absorb heat from the um, generated by the inner, inner parts of the star. Um, I don't actually have a simple explanation. I wish I did. Um, I taught this in our graduate level stellar astrophysics class and it took me a long time to be able to explain it properly. Um, and I don't have a simple explanation. It's a complicated interaction um, between the um, rate at which the outer layers, layers of a star can absorb or transmit heat and the generation of um, the heat at the center of the star. Um, so it is understood, but um, it's a complicated, complicated calculation. So, Actually, it was first worked out by a guy named Bob Christie, who um, later became the president of Caltech. Um, it's an interesting calculation, but a complicated one. So anyway, we can use the um, we can use the Cepheid variable as a standard candle, because once we know the period, we know the luminosity, and then we see how bright it is. We can infer how far it is. So that's what happens. It turns out that Cepheid variables are bright enough. There are some Cepheid variables that are close enough so that we can actually measure their physical distance through parallax. 
Once we've figured out the relation between the distance and the apparent brightness, we know exactly what the luminosity is. Then it turns out that there are some galaxies that are close enough that the Cepheid variables are bright enough to see. And so we can measure the distances to those galaxies. And some of those galaxies also host type 1a supernovae. And so we know the distances to those supernovae. So we use Cepheids in our own galaxy to, to figure out the distances to those Cepheid variables. We then use those Cepheid variables to figure out or calibrate the brightnesses of supernovae. And then supernovae are extremely bright, so they can be measured or observed out to very, very large distances. And so we can figure out how far a supernova is based on how bright it appears on the sky. Now, the velocities are determined by something called a, the cosmological redshift, which is analogous to a, it's essentially a Doppler shift. So if you've ever heard a siren moving towards you and then passing so that it's moving away, you'll hear that the siren has a higher pitch when it's approaching you than when it's moving away. And the reason is that sound waves um, are a wave-like phenomena. And so if the truck or if the ambulance is moving towards you, then the arrival time of successive pulses in the sound wave are compressed and the frequency or the pitch um, is higher. And then when it's moving away from you, the arrival time of those successive peaks that we hear um, is longer. And so the frequency um, and pitch are lower. So we can do the same thing with electromagnetic waves. And it turns out that um, if you look at a spectrum of a supernova, that supernova, so this is the spectrum of the supernova as a function of the wavelength or frequency of the observation, electromagnetic frequency. And a typical supernova has a bunch of features. It has emission lines and absorption lines associated with various atomic transitions. And we know what the frequencies or wavelengths of these transitions are. And so if we measure them, we'll see that they are at longer wavelength if the supernova is further away. So this is something that we can do very, very well. We can measure those velocities very precisely by comparing the observed frequencies of these lines with the frequencies that we measure in the laboratory. Um, you have another question. So the way we identify a Cepheid variable is a regular variation in its apparent brightness? Uh, yep, that's it. You, you look at it for a long time and it goes up and then it comes back down, it goes up and it comes back down. Um, a supernova, um, especially a type 1a, so it turns out that supernovae aren't the only ex cosmic explosions out there. There are all kinds of novae and different types of supernovae. Um, the supernova is actually recognized by its light curve. So it becomes very bright and then it decays with time. It has a very characteristic shape and is also identified by features in its spectrum. So that's how we identify a supernova or a type 1a supernova as a type 1a supernova. So when you do this, um, these are the results that you get. So this is from a paper by Reese and collaborators, the shoot, it's called the Shoes Collaboration. I don't remember what it stands for. Um, from a few years ago, <clears throat> this is the brightness of the supernova in astronomy language, they call it magnitudes. And this is a complicated formula for the velocity at which it's moving, at which is moving away. And so here is that Hubble law, the proportionality between the velocity and the distance. And the slope of this line is that Hubble parameter that we measure from supernovae. And the number turns out to be 74 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Um, you have another question, which is, if the spectrum of an element gets redshifted far enough, how do astronomers prevent mistaking it for another element? Ah, that's a good question. So. Typically, you need to have several lines to identify any given line. So if all I showed you was this little part of the spectrum, you would just see a dip and you wouldn't be able to identify it. But um, <clears throat> if you have a whole bunch of lines, then you can compare, um, you can use the, the relative frequencies of the different lines to infer what the different lines are. Does that make sense? Or put another way, this is a supernova 
spectrum. And um, it's a template for any other type 1a supernova. So any other type 1a supernova spectrum will go down and up and down and up and down and up and down, just like this. But it will either be the whole thing will either be shifted to the right or to the left, depending on the recessional velocity. So it's not any individual line, but it's actually a family of lines that we fit or the entire spectrum. So that gives us 74. So now I'm going to attempt to describe how it is that we infer the Hubble constant from the cosmic microwave background. So again, this is the relic electromagnetic radiation left over from the Big Bang. Here is a picture that I like to show um, of the first image of the cosmic microwave background that was made. Um, and this is actually what the sky would look like if your eyes operated at radio frequencies. As I said, the entire sky glows. And there are um, variations though in the brightness of the sky. So in some regions, the temperature intensity of that radio frequency radiation is gonna be a little bit larger than in other areas. And the color contrast here is set. So these represent roughly speaking variations of one part in 10 to the five. And this is actually the sky, the image of the sky, uh, the radio frequency image of the sky superposed on the launch site um, from Antarctica. That, and this is the balloon experiment that actually measured the, uh, that made the measurement. So this is actually a fairly big mountain and this is a cloud and this is what the sky looks like above the cloud. This is a, our modern picture of the cosmic microwave background. This is actually a map of the intensity or temperature of the cosmic microwave background across the entire sky. Um, this is a Malawi projection of the entire sky, the entire spherical sky. So um, if we had you know, a map of the earth, this would be what it looks like on a Malawi projection. So the entire earth is projected out like this and the cosmic microwave background actually is a map on the entire sky, but we project it onto our two-dimensional screen in this way. Now, <clears throat> the cosmic microwave background, um, when we look at the cosmic microwave background, we see a spherical surface in the universe. Um, the radius of that sur spherical surface is about 14 billion light years, because this is light that was emitted 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And so we're seeing a snapshot of the universe as it was 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And it looks like this. And again, the temperature, the, the color contrast is set so that the temperature difference between the brightest spots and the coldest spots is roughly one part in 100,000. Now, this does not look like anything in particular, but I claim that we can use this map to infer the Hubble parameter. So I'm gonna explain it in the following way. <clears throat> when you look at this, you don't see anything in particular. When you look at this, you see a bunch of random dots spread on the screen, nothing in particular. But our eyes and brains are trained to recognize patterns. So this is a picture that has also the same number of dots also arranged on the screen, but you see that there's sort of, there is some structure here. There's sort of five agglomerations. Um, here's another picture, five agglomerations of dots, but now the dots are sort of in circles. So you can tell that. Um, here they're sort of in squares rather than circles. So you can sort of tell that these are squares, those are circles. And this is again, the same number of dots, uh, but now it's sort of spread on a lattice. And you know, without doing any mathematical analysis, your eyes and brain identify the pattern. So this map that I showed you looks like gibberish, but if we know how to look at it, then we'll see that there's actually interesting information. This is sort of the point of science. So this is a, a code. Um, so people who are good with codes can usually figure this one out pretty quickly. This looks like gibberish, but this actually says something. And if you, know how to, if you don't know how to read it, you don't know what it says, but if you know how to read it, you know what it says. So this is actually a very simple code or a very simple cipher. I simply relate, replaced every letter in the alphabet by the one that precedes it. And so if you do the backward transformation, what you see is that this gibberish 
actually says the true sign of intelligence is not knowledge, but imagination, something that Albert Einstein said. He did many more impressive things, but once you get to be that good, anything you say gets attributed to, you, know, you attribute much more important to it. So this is the whole point of science. We start with gibberish, we craft the code, and we discover some type of meaning. Uh, you have a question. The hotspots of the CMB look quite chunky. Does that translate to big high density areas, areas in the visible or invisible universe? Uh, the answer is yes. And I will dis discuss that a little bit more in the next few slides. Yes. Um, denser regions and less dense regions look hotter and colder, respectively. So that's the whole point of science. We try to find hidden patterns in nature. Um, here's a good example. In paleontology, what you do is you go someplace, and you start to find some funny looking rocks, and then you collect them. And then what you realize is that if you put them together in the right place, they, they give you a dinosaur. So that's what we're trying to do. This is our dinosaur. This is our cosmological dinosaur. So the way that we understand and interpret this um, traces back to some mathematics that was developed by Fourier um, close to 200 years ago. And what Fourier realized is that anything can be represented as a bunch of waves. So here is a very simple wave. It is a sine wave. For those of you who know what a sine wave is, and those of you who don't know what a sine wave is, this is a sine wave. Now here is another sine wave with a slightly smaller amplitude and a slightly higher frequency or smaller wavelength. If I add those two together, I get a pattern that looks like this. If I then add another wave of smaller amplitude and smaller frequency, so like higher frequency or smaller wavelength, I get this pattern. And if I add another one, I get this. And if I do it again, I get this. And if I keep going, adding smaller and smaller wavelength waves of smaller and smaller wave amplitudes, I get this. So anything, any pattern can be represented as a bunch of waves. So the wave transform of this is this. So this is what I showed you. I started with one high amplitude, long wavelength wave, and then I successfully, successively added shorter wavelength amplitude, shorter amplitude waves of um, higher frequency, okay? So the wave transform of this is this. The wave transform of this spike is a flat line. And this mathematics also underlies something that baffles a lot of people when they hear about it, which is in quantum mechanics, we always talk about wave particle duality. Is a wave, you know, is a particle a wave or a particle? Is a photon a wave or a particle? It turns out it's both. And it simply is this mathematics. Anything can be understood as a sum of waves. And it also works for images. So I can take the Fourier or wave transform of Albert Einstein, and this is what Albert Einstein looks like in Fourier space. So this is the wave image of Albert Einstein. Now, of course, if I give this to you, you can't tell me that it's Albert Einstein, but if you know the mathematics, then it's straightforward to take this and translate it into this. So it turns out that typically we humans understand things in what we call configuration space, but sometimes nature talks to us in wave space. And this is one example of it. The wave transform of this, which looks like gibberish, turns out to be this. And the details are not important, but there's clearly a pattern here. So first of all, it's a spherical pattern, spherically symmetric, or a, a circularly symmetric pattern. There's a very bright spot in the middle, and then it gets excessively dimmer. There are a whole bunch of rings. The rings do not go to complete darkness in the middle. There's the width of the rings. And so there's a lot of information here. If I were to describe this to you quantitatively, I have to tell you the radius of the first ring, or the second ring, or the third ring, or the fourth ring. I have to tell you the, the profile of each ring. I have, to I have to tell you the brightness of each ring. And so there's a lot of information in here. And this is how it is that we quantify the seemingly random cosmic microwave background map. Now, it turns out 
that, so I told you this, there's a lot of information, the radii of the rings, the width of the rings, the brightness of the rings. It turns out that these peaks come from acoustic noise left over from the Big Bang. So roughly speaking, our universe was born in a Big Bang. Um, and um, it was a big explosion. And it turns out that it was very noisy. So when there is an explosion, you see a lot of light, but you'll also hear a lot of noise. So there is acoustic noise left over from the Big Bang. And the early universe, during the first 380,000 years of the universe, um, the, the, the universe was very dense and it consisted not of a bunch of galaxies or gravitationally bound objects, but it consisted of one fairly smooth gas of electrons and protons and electromagnetic radiation. And in that gas, there was acoustic noise. There were sound waves running around. And it turns out that the separation between these peaks and the Fourier transform of the cosmic microwave background, the separation between those peaks is determined by the sound horizon at the surface of last scatter. It is determined by the distance that a sound wave can travel from the Big Bang until the time that the cosmic microwave background is released. So it is determined by the sound horizon, which is roughly 380,000 years times the speed of sound in the early universe. Um, you have a question. Uh, you have someone who's wondering if, since it looks like a diffraction pattern, is it diffraction or is that a coincidence? So it is a coincidence. It does look like a diffraction pattern and you actually, you got me. Um, it is, this is actually a diffraction pattern that I just grabbed off of some random website, I Google diffraction pattern. Um, and the reason is that usually we plot this in um, cosmology in a different way. But if you actually do plot it in this way, it turns out to look very, very, very similar. So it's not, this, this is actually a picture of a diffraction pattern. The cosmic microwave background Fourier transform is not precisely a, of a diffraction pattern, but for all, for, you know, uh, you know for a, a cartoon-like picture, it actually looks surprisingly similar to a diffraction pattern. So, and the reason is that the, the diffraction pattern, I, I, I can explain the reason later if you want, but there's a reason it does look like a diffraction pattern. So from the separation between these rings, we can figure out how far a sound wave traveled in the early universe. So we'll call that R sub S. So that's this distance over here. And then the cosmic microwave background is 14 billion light years away. So that's this D sub A. And the angle subtended by that sound horizon is this theta sub S. And this is actually what we measure. We measure the angle subtended by the sound horizon at the surface of last scatter, because this is a measurement of an observed angle. So what we measure is the angle subtended by the sound horizon at the surface of last scatter. And it turns out that we infer this distance to the surface of last scatter by the expansion rate. If the expansion rate of the universe is larger, then the universe got to where it is more quickly. And so the distance to the surface of last scatter is smaller. If the expansion rate is smaller, then it took a longer time for the universe to get where it is and the distance to this surface of last scatter is larger. So this distance, d sub a, is inversely proportional to the Hubble constant. R sub s is the sound, sorry, theta sub s is the angle subtended by the sound horizon, which we measure from the cosmic microwave background. And then R sub s is the sound horizon, which we can calculate in our cosmological models. So this is how we infer the Hubble constant from the cosmic microwave background. We measure this, we calculate this from our models, and then we get the Hubble parameter. So this gives us though the Hubble tension because when we do this, oh, I missed it. So when we do this, oh yeah, sorry, I'm just going to duplicate that slide. When we do this, we get 67.4. 
So the cosmic microwave background analysis gives us 67.4, the supernova gives us 74. So something is strange. So there are three explanations. Either the supernova analysis is, has some type of error or misunderstanding in the interpretation. A second explanation is that there's something um, missing or misunderstood in our interpretation of the cosmic microwave background measurements. Um, all I can say is that everyone in cosmology has looked at this. Uh, this has received more scrutiny than just about anything else in astrophysics in recent years. And so far, nobody has been able to find any problem with either this analysis or this analysis. So that does not prove that there is no problem with either analysis, but there's no obvious problem. And so the third explanation is that there's something missing in our standard cosmological model. The flat lambda CDM is um, our jargon for a standard cosmological model. So you have a question. Yep. Oh, sorry. Um, is the difference between 67 and 74 really significant in this context and why? Uh, yeah. So the reason that it's significant is that we have a standard cosmological model that has this ridiculous name, flat lambda CDM, which makes no sense. Um, but the standard cosmological model is based on general relativity, which I would say is a very well understood and very well established um, theory of gravity, and on uh, the observation of the contents of the universe. So the contents of the universe are um, things that we call baryons or ordinary atomic matter, the things that we are made out of and that everything in the solar system is made out of. Um, it consists of this cosmic microwave background, this electromagnetic radiation. Um, it consists of a bunch of neutrinos that are left over from the Big Bang. Neutrinos are um, very low mass, um, very weakly interacting particles. And it also consists of something that we call cold dark matter, which is material whose nature is not known, but that interacts only through gravitational interactions. Um, so it interacts with everything else only with gravitational interactions. So if we take general relativity and um, populate, if we populate a universe with these four components of matter and then um, evolve the uh, observed universe back in time using general relativity, um, we get an explanation for this cosmic microwave background for all its features. We get an explanation for just about everything else that we see in the universe. So if we do understand this basic cosmological model based on general relativity, then these two should hang together. And if they don't hang together, it seems to suggest that maybe there's something missing in that cosmological model. Maybe there's something beyond this, some new physics beyond that that we've already put in, in the standard cosmological model. And so this is why people are so interested um, at first, we thought maybe it was just measurement error on the part of these guys or these guys, or the errors weren't the measurements weren't precise enough. But with time, these error bars have gotten smaller and these error bars have gotten smaller. Both sets of measurements have received increased scrutiny and the disparity I think has become more serious. I see the question is flat in the name of the model relating to the shape of the universe being flat, open or closed? The answer is yes. So, <clears throat> I am going to spend a few remaining minutes telling you very briefly about um, one possibility. So one possible explanation is something that a student of mine, Tanvi Karwal, and I came up with in 2016. So she was a graduate student with me until a few years ago. She got a PhD. She's now a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania. So um, we came up with an idea that we called early dark energy. And the idea was, suppose the early universe expands faster, or the universe expands faster at early times than it does in the standard cosmological model. So in the standard cosmological model, we obtain an expansion rate for the early universe based on general relativity and those components of matter that I told you about. But suppose for some reason, the early universe expansion rate, the expansion rate was larger in the early universe, that would then imply that there'll be less time for sound waves to propagate before the cosmic microwave background is released. 
That would then imply that the sound horizon is smaller. And if the sound horizon is smaller, then using those formulas I showed you, we would infer a larger value for the Hubble parameter. So that was what we did. So again, if the sound horizon is smaller and theta sub s is fixed, this is something we measure, and d is inversely proportional to the Hubble constant, then a smaller sound horizon implies a larger Hubble constant. So the way we, the, the way we explained this um, increased early expansion rate is in the following way. We postulated something called early dark energy. So this plot shows you the density of matter as a function of time. And actually this is a backwards plot. So early times are off to the right, late times are off to the left and the universe today is somewhere off to the left over here. And this is the density of um, ordinary matter, the orange. So at early times, it is less dense than the red, or sorry, the blue. So the blue here is the cosmic microwave background radiation. So it constitutes a small fraction of the total density of the universe today, but at early times was the dominant contribution, um, constitute the dominant contribution to the energy density of the universe. Matter um, is more significant today than radiation, but at early times it was subdominant to radiation. And there is also evidence from that accelerated cosmic expansion that I talked about at the beginning for an additional component of matter called um, dark energy or the cosmological constant. So that's the green. And so today, the green and the red are fairly close together. The radiation, are, the radiation is a little bit less. And what we postulated is that at early times, there was an additional component of matter that we call early dark energy that had a constant energy density, like a cosmological constant at early times, but then at some time had an energy density that then decayed. And this indicates the time at which the cosmic microwave background decreases, uh, last scatters. Now, according to general relativity, the expansion rate is determined by the total density of matter. And so, oh, I should say here is a plot of the fraction of the total energy density that is in the form of early dark energy density. So it's negligible at very early times. It's negligible at very late times. So it would have very or no impact on anything that we see in the universe um, since the time of the cosmic microwave background. It would have no impact on anything in the very early universe. But at some time before the cosmic microwave background was released, this model suggests that the, or tells us the expansion rate would be slightly larger than in the standard cosmological model by about 10%. And so if we increase the expansion rate, if we increase the density in the early universe, we can increase the expansion rate by about 10%. We can decrease the sound horizon by about 10%. And then from this formula over here, the Hubble parameter that we infer from the cosmic microwave background is then increased by about 10% which is roughly speaking the discrepancy between 74 kilometers per second per megaparsec and 67 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So that was basically the idea. Um, it was a simple paper. There wasn't a whole lot more to it than this. Um, in subsequent years, um, we and some other collaborators have worked out the details of this model and several different manifestations of this model much more carefully and shown that it can work. And um, our work has gotten a lot of other people interested. There have been lots of other papers that have followed up on our original paper and our second paper, um, you know, testing, further testing the model, um, this, this, um, investigating further consequences of the model, um, trying to elaborate different details in the model and also coming up with um, realistic physical, um, um, fundamental physics theories um, in which such new physics would arise. Um, one of the things that's been interesting to us um, is the possibility that if this is what's going on, that there might be um, recurring dark energy throughout the universe. So I told you there was a tiny cosmological constant today that was discovered in 1998. 
For various reasons, we believe that there was a huge cosmological constant in the very early universe in the first fraction of a nanosecond after the Big Bang. If this early dark energy, so if this Hubble tension survives, and if early dark energy is the correct explanation, it implies that there's something like a cosmological constant um, at intermediate times in the history of the universe. And if so, this seems to suggest that there might be recurring periods of cosmological constant-like behavior throughout cosmic history. So this is just a speculation. And one of the reasons that it's interesting is that there's an idea called the string axiverse, um, which is an idea for um, cosmological consequences of string theory. So string theory is an effort to um, unify the fundamental forces of nature. And one of the consequences of string theory might be something like recurring dark energy. So we are interested in this idea also for this reason. Um, you so, have a question, uh, which is, despite being insignificant, can the impacts of early dark energy be observed in inflationary gravitational waves? Ah, that is a good question. And the answer is maybe. Um, <clears throat> so the answer is a little more technical than I can get in this talk, but the answer is possibly. Um, and I just wrote a paper about that half a year ago, which is why I know the answer. It's conceivable that it could show up in the inflationary gravitational wave signature in the cosmic microwave background polarization. So, of course, when there are problems in science, when there are discrepancies between measurements, we want to understand the, or the, the source of that discrepancy. And of course, we also want to scrutinize the measurements. So I just want to tell you that there are going to be, in addition to supernovae and cosmic microwave background, several other ways to um, try to measure the Hubble constant in the universe today. So there's something called gravitational lensing time delays. So if I look at a very massive galaxy cluster and I see a quasar, a very bright source behind that galaxy cluster, it can be gravitationally lensed. So these are actually examples of gravitationally lensed systems. So for example, down here, these four images are four different images of the quasar. And a quasar can be variable, can get very bright and then get dimmer on over the time scale of several weeks or months. But if you see several images, you might see this image get brighter first and then this one and then this one and then this one. So if you can measure those time delays, that allows you some way to measure the Hubble constant. And people are trying to do this now. Um, there is a new technique called the tip of the red giant branch. If you look at a bunch of stars in a gravitationally bound um, cluster of stars, um, this is a plot of the luminosity of the stars versus the um, color of the stars. And there's a branch of very red stars that are very bright called the red giant branch. And there are good reasons to believe that there is a maximum brightness that they can reach. And so if you measure the maximum, the, the brightest star in a given cluster, you can infer the distance. And this technique is now being pioneered by Wendy Friedman, who is a native Tarantonian. Is that the word? So Wendy is originally from Toronto and she was actually an undergraduate and a graduate student at the University of Toronto. She's now at the University of Chicago and she is now pioneering this tip of the red giant branch technique. And then there are also gravitational waves which have made a, got, got a lot of interest in astrophysics and physics over the past few years. There's some prospects that if we detect the gravitational wave signal from merging neutron stars, we might be able to use those as a standard candle to measure the Hubble constant. And actually there's already a preliminary measurement for the Hubble constant from gravitational waves that have been de detected so far, but it's not yet precise enough to be um, very useful for this discrepancy yet. So this is it. I'm gonna close with a slide I got from Adam Reese who does the supernova measurements. We have a standard model, standard model of cosmology with planets, stars, gas, um, dark matter and dark energy. Um, there is this tension in the standard cosmological model. Oh, where is it? Yeah. Oh, there it is. Cos I'm, I'm, I'm hoping some of you have seen the movie Rashomon. 
So Rashomon is a great uh, Kurosawa movie, a Kira Kurosawa movie about um, a trial where different witnesses um, report on the same events, but tell it from different vantage points and see different things. So are we actually seeing different things because are we actually looking the same thing, but seeing different things or are we actually seeing different things? So we have um, possibly something interesting and new in the, in the, the universe. Um, and what I talked about was early dark energy, but um, there are actually other explanations that have also been postulated, which are probably worthy of other talks. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. But you do have one person who was wondering if the paper that you were talking about is published and if you could link it. Um, which paper, the gravitational wave one? Yes. Uh, yes, give me a second and I will link it. Uh, let's see. All right, I find my uh, chat box. Ah, there it is. Okay, it's in the chat box. Ah. So, should I take questions from the Q and A? Yes, please. Okay. Um. Could you elaborate a bit more on how the waveform of the CMB is different or is similar to a diffraction pattern? So it turns out that a diffraction pattern um, arises when you try to take a beam of light and pass it through a circle. So if I have a circle and I pass a beam of light through, um, but the wavelength of the light is comparable to the size of that ring, then I get this diffraction pattern. So the diffraction pattern arises because the boundary of that ring is sharp. And when I have a sharp feature in physical space, that gives rise to this ringing or these waves in frequency space, in, um, in the Fourier space. And what happens with the cosmic microwave background is that um, if I have an overdense region in the very early universe, that gives out, um, that expands as a shock wave moving at the speed of sound. And so if I have an overdense, um, over density in the early universe and the, at the Big Bang, it expands out as a spherical shock wave. And that spherical shock wave has a fairly sharp surface. And so when I look at that in wave space, that fairly sharp surface in wave space rings more or less like a diffraction pattern. It's a fairly generic feature. Um, Whenever I have a sharp feature in, in physical space, in Fourier or wave space, it um, has diffraction-like behavior. Let's see, there's another question. What do you think about conformal cyclic cosmology and its explanation about CMB? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't know if I place much confidence on any of the specific models um, of cyclic cosmology, um, but I do admire and applaud the efforts. So um, in cosmology today, we have a standard story called inflation, which is sort of um, an explanation for how, what set the big thing in motion. Um, and inflation has done very well at explaining a number of features of the universe. And many theorists and many cosmologists like it a lot because of that. Um, but we don't really know what the physics responsible for inflation is. Um, and so it's not necessarily, you know, a the story. It is a story and it is a very good story, but we don't know whether it is the story. And some people um, believe that, you know, until we can verify that it is the story, it is worth um, exploring other stories um, or other possible, other, you know, possible mechanisms um, to explain how the 
um, what set the Big Bang in motion. And cyclic cosmology is sort of the, the premier such alternative explanation. And I think the cyclic models have a number of issues and unanswered questions and problems. Um, but I think that the effort to explore them has taught us a lot about um, other alternative mechanisms um, and also taught us about inflation. So I like, I'm a big fan of the endeavor and I've worked a little bit on it, but um, I don't have much confidence yet in the specifics of the models. So by confirming 67 or 64, would we have to do drastic changes to what we know until now, or would it be a compliment adding more detail about the pre-CMB epoch? Um, I don't know. Um, from the point of view of cosmology, it would be a detail about the pre-CMB epoch. Um, let me see, from the point of cosmology, it's just this little blip over here. The question though is any idea that anybody's come up with to explain where this blip might have come from um, involves some pretty significant new physics. So if it is new physics, it's not just a, it's not a question of um, a different mix of the ingredients that we already have in the standard cosmological model. It actually requires the introduction of something fundamentally new um, in physics and in our cosmological model. So in some sense, it is a blip, but I think, um, I think realistically, it's gotta be a lot more than just a blip. Let's see, hold on, I lost my... Uh, question window. Does the value of H naught also affect the shape of the universe and also its eventual fate? Um, the answer is no. So the Hubble parameter just um, quantifies or parameterizes how fast the universe is expanding. Um, but that has nothing to do about whether the universe is closed or open or flat. Um, we can um, depend by doing with some additional modeling. Um, so for example, in our standard cosmological model, um, the shape of the universe is related to some, um, is, has something to do or is related to um, a given relation between the Hubble constant and the density of the universe. So you'll sometimes hear people say that the value of H naught um, uh, determines the shape of the universe, but that's not really correct. Okay. All right, do we have any further questions? So if any of you have feedback, please email me. You can find my email address online. If there was a, something that could have used more explanation or that didn't come across well, please let me know. Uh, hopefully I can do a better job with the next audience with anything that uh, didn't come across well. Oh, you, you do uh, have another Okay, question. how do we calculate the density of the universe? Do we just use homogeneity and then extrapolate our local observation outwards? Ah, uh, that's, that's a, let me see. That's a good question. So we don't, so the, the density of the cosmic microwave background, we measure directly because we actually know what the intensity of this cosmic microwave background is. We measure it directly. The densities of dark matter and of baryons or ordinary matter is done in a slightly different way. And it's actually done in a number of different ways that ultimately give converging results. So first thing you can do is try to figure out what's the mass of a typical galaxy through its dynamics, and then see how many galaxies there are in any given cubic you know, megaparsec. Um, but we also have very precise values of the densities of dark matter and ordinary matter from the cosmic microwave background. So from that diffraction pattern, the, I told you that there are many numbers that we need to quantify it, like the, the radii of the, different, um, of the different rings, the brightnesses of the different rings. So um, we can infer the density of dark matter and the density of baryons 
through different combinations of those um, observables that we infer from that pattern. So those are not those are values of those densities that we infer um, within the context of our a given co our cos our standard cosmological model. All right, thank you. And it looks like Katerina from ASX has just put your email into the chat for everyone. So anyone who would like to provide feedback, please feel free to just send an email. Uh, and on that note, thank you so thank much you for inviting me. For thank you guys all for joining me to talk about cosmology on a Monday, dreary in Baltimore Monday afternoon. <laughs>